It's just weird, I think. Like, normally we'd be touring. We'd have gone straight into a bunch of shows, but I, d- I think we were kind of like anti doing um, like socially distant stuff. And uh, there's a few bits I'd, I'd like to do, but yeah, we're just still pushing. The tracks are kind of doing uh, doing their thing, and the, the support's been really nice. Um, yeah, and just just uh, just ticking over really. We've got like a lot of festivals through the summer, but it's kind of a bit up in the air, I guess. Again, after a few cancelling yesterday and things, but hopefully hopefully it'll be okay I feel like at least a few go ahead fingers crossed they'll kind of get and there's going to be a gap where they happen and it's just which ones end up in that little space yeah we've got like we've got one a week in August so I'm hoping that is the gap but I mean it might not be but yeah then we've got we're like kind of pretty uh, pretty rammed from then on to the till Christmas time so just hope stuff happens man it's it's crazy it's so tough to to kind of keep changing and, and pushing things back for a lot of people. I know it's kind of, I've had a bit of a different trajectory through lockdown and stuff and not really, I guess I've kind of emerged at the, at the end of the pandemic and taken the time through the, through the pandemic to kind of get, every, get uh, everything in order, you know? Yeah, I feel like if festivals do go ahead this summer, you're kind of timed it quite well. I think so. Like you say, taking the first half to prepare, second half to launch it, and then just as everything opens back up and you're kind of riding high on that wave. Yeah, yeah, and we're you know I've been I've been in this studio for three years, so it's not like we're um, not like we've not been doing anything. Do you know what I mean? It's like we've kind of been working away and and you know working on the live show as well, which has been a thing that we've just been playing music together. Like I share the uh, share the studio space with a few other people, and then the building's just like full of amazing musicians, and we all just play music together, and it's just been this like joyous thing that's kind of kept everyone going, and we've had this kind of little bubble. Um, but the show's ready, the music's ready, the second EP's done, and it's just kind of like ready to, all ready to go, really. How how many kind of rooms are there in the studio space that you're at? You're saying it's kind of all full of musicians, everyone's got their own room. There's eight eight or ten studios on this floor, and then there's like art spaces upstairs. There's a photographer, um, a fashion designer who's got like a sustainable brand, um, who's doing some like amazing things. Uh, there's a couple of graph artists. There's a sound system up there as well, like a dub nice. thing, um, which is pretty, <laughs> can get pretty loud and pretty crazy and you can't work if it's on. Um, but yeah, it's great. They, um, they've been doing like a bunch of live streams and starting to do some in-person stuff here as well. So it's just like a real hub in the city. Um, it's great. That's great. Because you're across from Easy Life, aren't you? They're not they're, rooms uh, across the hall, yeah. They're in the room across the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me and Lewis and the cast just played music together since we were like 15, 16 as well. So it's just this place where we've all just kind of ended up in and it, it's like a really healthy space, you know? How long have you been in there, did you say? Four years in November, uh, like three, three and a half years now. Um, yeah, we were in another room across the way and then moved into here. Um, this is their old room and they moved to the one across the way because it was slightly bigger. But I think I've got the better deal between you and me. Um, I've got no <laughs> no neighbours on either wall, so I can kind of get a bit of peace and quiet. And they've now got like um, a couple of bands either side of them. So uh, <laughs> I've got a sweet deal. And a dub station right above yeah, them. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's right above me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, uh, I thought we should start off with the most important question of all. Can I get the big business out of the way to start off with? Did you expect Lester to bottle it? Oh man, um, yeah, like we did it last year, and I think it was just this kind of like, I don't know. I mean, we won the FA Cup, but it's like it felt like, I don't know. It, I'm feeling, I feel like I'm being ungrateful, but you know, we won the FA Cup, and we've not done that before. But we've also we've been in the Champions League, so I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take a positive from it and say we won the FA Cup. But yeah, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't surprising. Um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. It was just sad. You live and you learn, I think. Hopefully we'll uh, be be back stronger next year. <laughs> well, I mean, the FA Cup was kind of the opposite of the end of the season in the league because that was kind of right at the end. You know, you've got Schmeichel making the save. It's the one time you didn't know. bottle it. Well, I mean, look, we, <laughs> we won. We won. We won that. So we can't, uh, we can't complain too much. But yeah, it, it was just like, it just felt like a bit of an anticlimax after being there like all year. Um, and yeah, I think it's just become, it's become such a fabric of the city. It always has been like, you know, everyone I know, like growing up has always gone to the football at some point, even if they don't hold like a season ticket. And it's just such a part of the city. And then obviously after 2015, 2016, it was just become this other thing, which is insane. And, and I don't know, it's just kind of like woven itself deeper. And I guess like there's so much going on else in the city and it's kind of kicked that on and put like a spotlight on other things. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, it doesn't make, doesn't make this year any more disappointing. But <laughs> when you're going to the football, you know, and you're growing up, is there something 
in that communal experience of a group of people singing together in that stadium? Does that inspire you in some way when we look at what you're doing now? I music think, club? like, as a byproduct of it, it probably did. Um, I kind of came to music like a little, like I say later, but it's not, it wasn't late. Like, I didn't really pick up an instrument until I was like 18, 19. I always liked music and went to shows and gigs and stuff, but didn't really think I'd be capable of doing it. And then just decided one day, like I wanted to, and then haven't really looked back um, and just like found my thing. And, you know, it's, it was strange, but yeah, I think, I think going, I think going to those games and just being in a city that always like now punches above its weight in terms of its output, like creatively, especially everything going on, you know, at the minute it's yeah. It, I don't know. I think there's just this kind of like, underdog spirit which like a lot of small towns that aren't like that are just outside the biggest cities have um because they have to because they've like everyone's got a point to prove here and everyone cares about each other as well so you know it's it goes hand in hand i think i mean speaking of football clubs your first ban was clubs right <laughs> correct yeah 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 <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Mm. It's, it's interesting because I, I was listening to an interview with you where you spoke about after that kind of wrapped up you kind of went anti-band yeah, you, said you felt like why? Yeah. Why was that? I think making noise in a room with other people is like now. Not it's, it isn't my worst nightmare now, but I just think it was like the most counterproductive environment creatively. I, I just I think it was like sometimes it was too democratic, and I think sometimes every every band that pushes through and does things you know interesting has someone at some point, whether it, whether it changes at points on records and stuff like look at Fleetwood Mac, they kind of took it in turns to lead the creative direction or whatever of, of a record, whether it be like harmoniously or not, there was someone ha- who had something that they wanted to get across. And I just feel like in a band situation and every kind of situation like that I've been in, um, I, uh, it just, it just kind of, I, I'm, I worry about being like too nice and everyone else's feelings a little bit too much. And I just kind of got sick of that and was like, okay, cool. It's time to go off and, and spend time by myself making the music that I had in my head. And it would always be like m- the music in my head by committee and would be a little watered down and wasn't like what I was satisfied with. And then with the doing, doing the solo project and stuff, but like by doing things by yourself, you haven't really got people interfering unless you want that interference and that interference is kind of necessary which I find now and I've kind of got a bit of a better balance with that now but you know in a live aspect the the band is the six of us now they're really bringing this thing to life and it's like it's so joyous and exciting and musical um and that's like a silly word to use but it feels really like a really visceral thing and it's, it's been so nice to start playing the EP songs that are out now and then stuff beyond that as well which is finished and ready um and feels like it needs six of us to play it and it's a real mission to work these songs out so yeah it's um I'm kind of I'm, I'm back in the middle between being anti-band and uh anti-solo artist <laughs> it's interesting what you're saying there about work the songs out because I heard you talking about you use the analogy it's almost like trying to figure out what the primary colours are and distill it down to that yeah always what do you what do you learn about the songs from doing that from figuring out what the primary colours of them are whether they're good or not <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you can't play them I think there's like a rule and, it, and it's very very different especially in like a lot of music being made now that this isn't necessarily the case but like in my experience and in my um understanding of the songs I'm trying to write if I can't play them on one instrument generally that they're not good enough for like what I want them to be because it's they need to be if I could if I could stand and perform them to you and they make complete sense then that's a song um, and then everything else is like an added bonus to that and 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 makes creates the world around like the core of the song being good and when you pull it back to the primary colors especially in the live environment you can't hide anything um and I'm incredibly lucky to be surrounded by like amazing players they are you know the band are so on it and and so so good at what they do it's it's never really felt like a struggle with the first two two or three times we'll play through things uh we'll kind of bumble through it and then by the fourth time or the week after we come back to a rehearse it's like it's done and it's like okay cool we're just going to keep playing this and make it better and 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 change things rather than worry about having to make it make sense i mean to come back to that primary colors analogy to how would you apply that to a song Say like New York Time, for example. What are the primary colors of that song when you bring it into that space? Uh, uh, it, me, me and the guitar. I think it's, it's, you know, the song, the record is 
I think it's like twelve tracks. The actual recording of it, I'll have to check. But it's no, it's no more than it's no more than like fourteen. It um, feels like more though. It's interesting. Oh, that's cool. That's really so. There's two. There's no drums. Uh, there's a tom, which I think the drums is a guitar um, being like plucked. The snare on the one. Yeah, it's. Um, I think the primary colors of that is is me and the guitar, and th- I've, even even playing that now, there's like a there's something that happens because it's like you know I, I've spoken about it like a relatively fair amount, and it's the most. It's still probably my favorite song. I think just because of I didn't feel like it. I had written it, or and when we got to the end of it, it was like, oh, that's happened. And I think there's just this magic that comes out of that. And if, even if I'm playing it, just me and the guitar, or there's an arrangement with the band where there's lifts and there's drops and it's incredibly dynamic, it, it feels like the power of what happened when that song was written is those primary colours in it, me, the guitar. And it's just this, like, this headspace, I guess, which is, which is kind of a, a weird thing to, to add into the mix. Are you back in that headspace every time you're performing it live? 100%. You have to get yourself to a certain place, yeah. I, I, it's so strange. It doesn't really happen with much else. Maybe a couple of the other songs, like I, I get really vivid memories of, of writing them and recording them and, and the experience of doing that and, and them coming together. But yeah, I think, I, I mean, you know, people say this all the time and I never believed it. The songs come out of the ether sometimes. You don't know you're going to write them. And, and I don't know, the whole, the whole like process of writing that was so like, incredibly powerful and made like really life affirming to make you be like, Oh, this is why I'm doing this. And it's, I don't know if I ever kind of doubt myself or anything, I'll kind of look back to that. But yeah, there's, um, yeah, it, the, the whole thing was a blur and it's just this, I, I'm always back in it and it, I, yeah, it's so hard to describe and so hard to put kind of put words to it's just, I think in every performance of it or, you know, anytime we've played it or I've played it to anybody physically sat and played it. Um, or you listen to the record, you just know there's this weight to it. And I think that's like, that's the thing that just instantly drags me back. And, and, you know, like, yeah, I had, I had a day yesterday. It's kind of funny. You asked me that actually, like I had a day of really reminiscing about being in New York and missing it and seeing it opening up again. And, and a lot of my friends kind of over there, uh, like posting about things opening up. I'm like, Oh God, I really, 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 really miss it. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a weighty tune. How long were you there for? Uh, I was there in 2017 and the end of 2017 and the start of 2018 and then all of summer uh, 2019 and I haven't been back since um, I came home in September 2019 and then yeah the pandemic happened um, and yeah I've got the itch I've got the itch. Would you have been back last year had the pandemic not happened? Without a doubt, I think, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I was, yeah, this this kind of conversation, I was having this conversation with my housemate this morning. Um, kind of feel like I've landed on what the record's going to be. And yeah, it's just this, it's just, yeah, it kind of revolves around that whole idea. And yeah, I don't know. It's just like this ingrained thing in my head that I need to like get back there or want to get back there. And that whole kind of like jokey American dream idea that people have. And it's like, I still kind of have like an innocence towards it because I had such a good time. And it's infectious. Yeah. I, it's a mad place. I don't know if you've ever been once. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, there's just, a, there's nowhere like it. It's just this insane energy. And I think it's like suited well to my personal personality and and like what kind of person I am like I get kind of wrapped up in the chaos and get excited by it and, and drawn in by it you know what do you think it is about your personality that draws you there when you say it's suited to it? I'm intrigued by chaos if something's happening I'm like I want to see what's going on like then there's something happening all the time there's like never there's not like a minute where you could be walking down the street and something could just be happening like whatever it is whether it's like I don't know like a like something setting a fire in a bin or someone like playing <laughs> this insane game of basketball to your left and you're like oh my god this is like this it's like a sensory overload constantly and I just I don't I think I can't be overwhelmed like too easily and I kind of I don't know I just get wrapped up in it and excited by it. I'm like a child I think I've got a very childlike mentality towards a lot of things and like New York just kind of like fed this open eyed like baby's day out kind of thing um, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that film but I've just I always, yeah, every yeah, time, yeah. yeah every time I'm there I just feel like I'm crawling around like just <laughs> waiting for someone just to pick me up and take me somewhere you know how how do you control that energy when you're creating that in your music because there's a cohesiveness to it and I imagine if you let that run completely rampant you wouldn't have that because it would just be going in so many different directions yeah it does and I think that I'm, I'm glad you say it's cohesive that's a big compliment uh, thank you um, yeah I don't know I think 
It's it's being surrounded by like good people um, and like people that keep me in check. It's good. Um, so I work with Mike and Ev Halls from Clean Cook Kid, a uh, band from Liverpool, on a lot of the um, on a lot of the writing and the production. Um, and they really help and har- like me to harness the, the the chaos and let me run with things and kind of help shape my ideas into kind of coherent things. Because I don't know, I think it's just like a I've got a really varied taste as everybody does now, and I think. I've become more fearless of that as well because I think music's more genreless than it's ever been. Um, I'm sure that's like a common thread of conversations you've had over the past year or so. Yeah, I mean, well, it's interesting to think about it in the context of your music too and what you were saying about how you grew a little tired of playing in bands. Was that almost lining up with music becoming more genreless at the same time? I think so. I think like, yeah, the, the idea of like an old, like the band as like a thing is kind of like redundant to me now and i think there's some amazing bands at the minute but yeah i don't know like just in the sense where you you make noise in a room and then you go to like a producer to record your songs in a studio i think that's gone and that's like it's changed things i think overwhelmingly for the better but it's like there's i don't know there's you know there's of course there's, there's laziness in anything and yeah i do I, but i do think that the idea of like a band in a room has kind of like slowly disappeared but you know I'm, I, I like it and I appreciate it and there's like this band I think the, this, this last year has been harder on bands than it has on artists like myself you know um, like there's so many bands that were kind of like on the up that I really 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 love and you know but like pretty established but you need to see them live like the Orioles and, and do nothing like they're live acts and they're amazing and it's like I'm itching to go and see them live and this year I can't imagine how like tough it must have been for them to not be able to play shows I don't know. It's like, I don't know how you feel about that or, you know, it's it's just something that I kind of find intriguing and and sad. Yeah, it's a shame. But then also, I feel like what we're seeing now is also maybe a glimpse into the future. And I think more and more the emphasis is going to be on how much you're creating and how often you're putting out music. When you look at what we're doing and this kind of hunger that we have to keep consuming stuff, I think the live experience, although it's always going to be really important for some bands, I think in general the industry is maybe going to move to favor people who are more studio acts perhaps. Yeah. I think it's just like the relentlessness, isn't it? Of like the machine of, yeah. And especially if you're, there's like certain artists I've had this, I had this conversation again this week um, about like artists kind of that are critically acclaimed. Like you've got like your Frank Ocean, he can go away for four years. And it's fine and, and it not be, but it's at that level, isn't it? And it's this. It's He's one a million. Yeah. And it's especially hard. And I think, I don't know. I've, I don't, I don't necessarily agree. And I don't think uh, the, the idea of just like plowing stuff out kind of makes me sad. Like, I don't know, just because you can put it out doesn't mean you should. And I don't think it's necessarily like a good idea just to throw music out because you feel you have to. If you put it, I think there's, st- there's still artists that are kind of like have pushed through with like quality over quantity, you know, and that's like, it's overwhelmingly like quantity based. But you look at like Christine and the Queens, she released just before the pandemic, the La Vita Nova and like that amazing short film nothing since and she it's just kind of gone and gone and gone and if you make good art then it's gonna get grabbed and taken into other other worlds and then you know have like a second life a third life a fourth life when it gets on a tv show or or it gets on a different playlist or someone else hears it and it goes viral on tiktok like you know if it's there and it's good enough look at dreams as well like that had its thing last summer as well the fleetwood mac tune and i don't know I, i just think if you're committed to making things that matter to you really 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 matter the rest of it will take care of itself and if you're committed to committed to pushing it and committed to working it and you know committed to to doing things that excite you then i think like you'll end up where you're meant to end up and and you know there's 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 caveats to that of course with like major label involvement and all those things but if you're like if you're true to yourself and make like good art, then I think it that can outweigh th- one amazing song can outweigh like twenty bang average songs. Well, that's the other interesting thing is that it still feels a little bit about that one song, doesn't it? Yeah, everyone's yeah. kind of ch- once you have that one song, you're kind of set. Well, or you're not, or you're kind of got this like poison chalice where if you've yeah. got like a TikTok song that goes viral, is that in the new one hit wonder? Possibly. If you, it's out of your, it's out of your control. Sometimes, if you can't, if you can't, um, if you can't jump on that train with it and put another song out that does as well, like three weeks later, it's gone. It's done. It's I don't know. It's, a, it's a strange extent, thing. But I think if you put out a TikTok song and say it does 150 million streams or whatever, 
you then have a section of that fan base that is going to stick with you. Yeah, I mean, even yeah. if every other song only does five million or whatever, you still have quite a devoted group of people that are enjoying your music. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's a scary thing. Like, I, I don't know how I feel about like that happening at any point because you don't control it either. And I guess you never control, like no one's ever controlled having like a hit um, per se. But yeah, it's a, it's a strange thing. And I think I think people that are in that world then and do that like quite often I think like one of my favourite artists that does that is Nina Nesbitt I just literally before this I saw her do the her Scott Girl Summer um, like TikTok and she does she does like songs for those videos and, and makes things to go with them and I think it's this like new hybrid artist isn't it that does kind of both sides and it's like I don't know it's just a new it's a new genre I guess to you know you see playlists like TikTok songs on Spotify now or, or whatever and yeah it's um, I guess it's a world that I'm like familiar with, but I don't know how I feel I would feel about like going into or like like um diving headfirst into, you know, or trying to make something for that. I think you made a pretty good point a few moments about where you said that just because you've made it doesn't mean you have to release it. Like I think I feel like artists need to be creating every day, but then you can be very selective within that about what you want to put out. I could not agree more, yeah. Um yeah, I you know, I write every day. Um and there's so much music that will never come out because it's like writing through the shit to get to the good stuff. And, you know, I think that has to be, it's very rare that people don't have to do that. And, you know, if you write a hundred songs, the chances of like two of them being good are probably pretty high um, or that you're happy with. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a big undertaking. And, but so it should be, I think you should, you should care. You should really care and, and take your time with things. And, and I, yeah, I don't know. I just, yeah, the disposability of stuff now, it's just, it's, it's part and parcel. And I don't think you should moan about it. You should, like, it, it is just part and parcel. And if you, if you don't like it, then I don't know, like, I don't know what you can do, but you know, just, just care. I don't know. I think, I think I really care about like what I do and I'm, I'm not saying not like other people don't in any way, shape or form, but like just, yeah, I think it's just like being considered all the time. And I'm like, I'm, I'm an overthinker. I think it's a probably rambling. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't put anything out unless I'm like a million percent sure that I'm like, I could stand by it and play it for the next 10 years in case it, in case that did happen. And I have to play it for the next 10 years, you know? Do you think you're an overthinker or do you think you're a perfectionist? No, I'm an overthinker. No, definitely an overthinker. I'm, I'm, I'm a perfectionist to a point, but I'm not like, if I kind of go like based off feelings and I've always written that way. Does it feel good to me now? Yes. Like follow that feeling. Don't be like, it has to be the perfect take. It, I think a, a take with better feeling than a better, is a, is a, is a better thing than like a perfect take, like a, a perfectly musically played take. You could be the best. You could be, you know, as good as Jacob Collier, but if you don't have his feel, you're not going to write his songs. You could be that talented as a musician, I think, but if you've not got like a feel or, or, an, or an awareness or a knowledge or an excitement about like your genre of music, then yeah, I don't think so. But yeah, with the mixes and stuff with the music, overwhelmingly, take a long time to, to get them done, but I won't sit and painstakingly dive into things. If it excites me and I, and it's, it's jumping out the speakers, I'm happy. Well, you mentioned there about having that feel. Is that something you can gain or is that something you're born with and that you have? <laughs> Great question. I don't know. <laughs> um, I think you probably are born with it because there's like a, there's a billion different feelings that you could, or feels you could have. And, you know, like, look at the, different genres of music that people write like I couldn't turn around and write a reggae record I could try but it'd be awful and I think I've got my feel and I've got my thing and that's like because of my personality and my music taste and and nature and nurture and and being raised listening to like top 40 music and then finding indie music like really early teens and be like oh my god and then now like they just kind of go like this in my head and it's you know it's it's incredibly exciting is that maybe why it's tough to be in a band sometimes as well because you all have different feels and they could all be pulling in different directions and not quite lining up yeah i think so i think that's probably and maybe you know on the flip side of it it's probably me being like too stubborn and being like no I, my idea is good <laughs> um and yeah but yeah i do think that but some you know sometimes people compliment each other and 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 now like the people i work with creatively co we complement each other and we'll butt heads on things and like we have similar feels but we have 
we've come to the same point from like different routes and we've picked different things up along the way, which influence our decision making. And I think that's the difference really. But yeah, like definitely, definitely, definitely has an effect. When, you know, talking of collaboration too, when did you get, do you get a choir in for Bad Bad Fun or is it just backing vocals kind of layered? No, um, it's it's me, Mike and Ev. It sounds like a choir. Yeah, wow. cool, good. Um, <laughs> yeah, we did, um, we have a, like a set way of doing the gang vocals, uh, all three of us around like one mic. Um, Motown style. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, fully. That's that's always the vibe, and especially with the new stuff. Uh, there's a real, there's a real Motown feel. There's a real, like a real Bee Gees feel as well with some of this new music. Um, and yeah, we just we kind of really dived into to like harmonic content and quality. Um, and especially with Bad Bad Fun, it was you know I wanted that to feel like you and your mates could like shout it at, at, at a festival or you know or whatever. Um, and it really does feel like that and you know playing it with the band now there's this everyone taking on different parts and pieces but yeah it's just the three it's just the three of us me mike and ev um doing layers and layers and layers and and, and building these songs up uh which is kind of always the case really yeah i love i love voices and harmonies and and yeah as many vocal takes as possible it's an interesting one to look at as well in terms of where you're kind of at perspective wise from a songwriting point of view because a lot of it is very rooted in the present you know you're talking about the start of it saying you're with your uni friends and she's with Jasmine or whatever and it's very there and now but then you'll flash back to other periods and go to the past how much do you think about tense in songwriting and how consciously aware are you of where you are at that point when you're writing um probably less than um it comes across as maybe like it's very impulsive I think and if I'm thinking about something, I'll write about it. And I think there's, I think the one thing that like unifies my songwriting is like the specificity of like events and places and people and things and, and little details. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know. They have to be, they have to be true to myself. Like I can't, I, I probably like in the terms of like a traditional sense, like not a very good songwriter because I hop between everything, but that's like the nature of my brain, as I've kind of said already, like drawn in by the chaos. And it's like, oh, I'm thinking about this again. So write about it or, or you know, this has just happened. So kind of like, you know, talk about it and, and talk about it in detail because that's, I think it's always like the specificity of certain events is like uh, as isolating as you think it's going to be is the thing that unifies people and and people always ask me about the jasmine lyric and who's jasmine and and like you know me and her laugh about it all the time it's it's because it's true like me and her were just hanging out and then i bumped into someone i was seeing before and yeah and it just started this like absolute snowball of events and yeah and and, and you know that it's a prompt it's it's a thing to be to intrigue like the listener and and to, to be like oh okay cool like who is jasmine or who is this person or where where like where were you what were you doing and uh, you know i'm sure people have had those those situations before and it makes it like vaguely specific for them yeah well, it's like, i think you referenced the cars in one of the songs as well, yeah, yeah 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 and then listening to the cars something yeah and then kind of stole the melody on just what i needed the lyric obviously <laughs> it's like yeah that's made my day man you're like the third person that's noticed that so thank you um yeah because obviously that's that's, that was yeah so that just just what i needed was the was the tune was listened to at the time um when we listened to the cars and then we that's the lyric yeah yeah so i listened to the cars it was just what i needed with the with the stolen melody from uh, from the cars tune as well pretty much <laughs> how like that encounter you were describing for uh bad bad fun how how soon after that will you write the track how soon after does it pour out i had the i think it's like the words will always come first and then they'll find like that was like five different versions of right person wrong time before it became right person wrong time you know what did the first version look like oh it was like it was so bad uh <laughs> it was like this i don't know it was quite kraut rocky like <laughs> yeah it was pretty industrial and i was just like i just had the phrase right person wrong time like i had just before you disappear as the phrase for the ep for maybe three years now and it, that got stuck in songs and it got stuck into different things but i always knew it was going to be the title of something meaningful to me um and yeah there's like a few of them now so i kind of i've always i've already landed on well ep2 is done and that's like titled and kind of had the revelation of what the album's going to be called um whenever we get to that point um yesterday which is exciting but that's been a phrase that's been around for a couple of years um yeah i'll just kind of go through really really intense periods of, of writing song titles and, and phrases and these things stick around and start to define like the next like year's worth of songwriting you know but yeah yeah i think I know, maybe bad bad fun became a song like a year after the that situation had kind of like happened and, and it was like bubbling on you know do 
when a phrase like right person wrong time comes to you do you know how important it's going to be in that moment uh yeah because i start thinking if i think about it for more than like a day and i keep going back to it i'm like okay cool that that matters that that matters like keep that that's an important one that can go in like the tick list and yeah then i'll kind of like expand on that from there and just sit and write um so everyone I met I, I went up to Liverpool for the first time maybe the first or second time to work with Mike and Ev like a couple of years ago I was sat in um, a Bold Street coffee just like I would always before, any, before I do anything like that or start my day I'll spend like half an hour just filling a page with ideas with, with scribbles with drawings with, with, with ideas around something like a phrase at right person right time um, and Mike and his friend Rich who's an like, amazing record producer came in and Mike had seen these books before and then he's like oh can I sit down with us okay cool and I sat down with him and he was just like oh show Rich your book and I was like I don't really think I want to. Uh, <laughs> and then he grabbed it and he was just like, Jesus Christ. He's like, mate, this needs burning. Um, so now there's like a running joke with them all that like, I have to burn sage after these books have been brought out and we've written something. And But you know, New York Time came out of it and, and, and Right Person, Wrong Time came out of them as well. Um, and, and and yeah, the Holy Bee. But yeah, it's uh, it's just like a funny thing, which yeah, it's, um, it's a very personal thing. And then like to kind of open that up to people was like a pretty daunting thing, I think, you know? How did you overcome that? Well, just just the, the, the scouse way of them being like, come on, then give it here. <laughs> <laughs> them being really forthright and like me being this kind of timid, introverted extrovert, like just hopping around and, and hiding in my own brain. And, and, you know, like, just like, oh no, but it's, oh, but, you know, it's, it's nothing's finished. And, and, you know, it, it, that extends to everything as well. Like when we're all sending demos to each other now, like I'm surrounded by very similar people. Everyone's always like, oh, do me a bounce. And it's like brackets, not finished, not mixed, unbounced, unmixed. I'm so sorry for existing brackets. <laughs> uh, you know, um, so I don't know, I guess, I guess they just dragged it out of me and now it's something that I'm more comfortable with, but still there's, there's a line I kind of draw and it's like, this thing's for me, you know? Um, and there's certain things I wouldn't share unless I like needed to or, or wanted to and, and probably would never make a record. It's just, I think there's like, that's like a strange thing as well. Like kind of pillaging your own brain and like self-sabotage and self-sacrifice is kind of like an unhealthy thing as well, but we're all guilty of doing it. Yeah. Well, especially when you're in the studio, it can be quite a vulnerable place mm. just because mm. you're so emotionally open at that point in time. Yeah. 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 I think, I think New York time again, like to go back to it, it's, that was the one. Um, yeah, it was just like the most intense period of time. And it was like the lowest I've been ever maybe I think, and didn't I just have no real recollection of, of writing it. And, and there's like two specific things I remember of like recording it and, and F kind of came back into the, to the flat when we were, we were writing. And she was like, we had to kind of take like two days off after you finished that because that we we just like exhausted by you. Then I just felt like, racked with guilt that I'd like put that on other people and had to kind of like unpick that for ages and yeah and then it, you know now we look back and it was just it's this kind of really beautiful thing and you know like they both said that, we, that you could have cut like the atmosphere in the in the in the flat in the studio with a knife because it was just this weight that I didn't really realize I was getting off my chest and and you know like this yeah it was a mad few days like, just like driving up there as well like kind of hallucinating and it's, it's yeah, still, I heard it with the birds. Oh man, like yeah, it's yeah, it's such like, a strange thing to talk about because it doesn't really feel real. And and you know, I always feel like if someone told me that, I'd be like, that's bullshit. But yeah, it's like it's almost like a, it's like the most visceral experience ever. Yeah, it's a strange thing. Um, but you know, that's kind of you know exists in the song forever, and, and I don't think it could have come from anywhere else and and like a, a, any other experience because yeah, there's like a you know you feel the weight in it. Is that a strange thing as well, kind of preserving such a low point in your life? Like preserving that time and a song and that atmosphere? Without a doubt, yeah. I think it's... I think that's probably why you end up in that headspace when you when, like, and play it again. And Yeah, it's... It, I, I think the, the more distance that comes between myself and, and that situation and that time in my life, like the easier I feel to talk about it. But I didn't play it to anyone for... I played it to my manager at the time. And that was it. I was like, yeah, I just, I didn't want to show anyone. I was like, this is probably never going to go out. And, and, you know, my, like they convinced me otherwise. And it just, yeah, it's like, a, you know, like everyone says these things, it's like a, it's a real healing process to, to do something like that, I think. And to know that you can come back from something like that as well. I think that's probably the most powerful thing I've taken from it. And, and knowing that it doesn't, that's not going to define me forever. And that's just like a point of time in my life, you know? Yeah. It makes it a little easier too if you end up back in a headspace similar to that point. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. 
you've got that like reference point, you knowing like, okay, cool. It's like, it could get worse. It could get better. It probably will get better. Yeah, for sure. New York time as well. When you played it to your manager, what was the kind of, what was the scenario in which you did that? And what was the kind of response that you got? Uh, a strange one because it was like, as in a time I was working with like a pretty like prolific manager who not no longer working with now. And he's like, he really instilled like some amazing things in me, but kind of, we both had like a different ideas of like what I wanted to be as an artist. I think basically I was just incredibly confused about what I wanted to be and had written that song and it just kind of didn't align with everything else. But I knew that was what was like intriguing me moving forward. And he was like, you've kind of got to choose what you've got to do. And I was like, I don't really want to, I don't think I know, like, I don't, I don't really know what I want to do, but I knew there was definitely something in that song that, you know, I had to kind of follow up and, and continue to work on in, in that like world and then just found my feet. And, and, you know, that was the second time I'd written with Mike, I think, and, and I didn't really look back and, you know, we had kind of exclusively worked together on everything now, but yeah, it was a strange start, really strange response. And, you know, I think I, I played it to the band maybe like three months later it's just like I was fearful. I think I was incredibly fearful of like people's reactions and, and again, showing that vulnerability and, and being like, look, I'm not okay. Um, yeah, but yeah, the, the response then was like really beautiful and then kind of started like some really cool conversations with within the band and within the, the studio space and, and, you know, who we all kind of talk to now. And, and this, it started like this kind of vow of openness with each other, you know. What sort of conversations? Just, I'm feeling like this. Is that normal? No. Well... I feel like that too, or I feel similar or, you know, it's just, it's, it's a safe space. It, the band, honestly, the band is the six of us are so open with each other, probably to a point that people, other people would find uncomfortable and other people do find uncomfortable sometimes because we just have this ability now and it's, it's a learned ability as well. I think anyone can do it to talk about everything. Like nothing is, nothing is off limits. And, you know, it started in conversations in the vans on the way home from shows. Just like, anyone ever feel like this? And then it was like, yeah, sometimes, but like, how do you actually feel? And then it would just kind of snowball into these conversations, which now are like part and parcel of our everyday existence with each other and our friendships with each other. That's normal. And it's great, man. It's powerful. It's really powerful. I think you've spoken about this before, how much you can take inspiration from those moments in life when you're having conversations with other people and learning from them and kind of swapping stories in that way. I think, you know, you learn, you learn, you learn and you die. Like you never stop, you never arrive and uh, with anything. And I think it's this, that's the thing I get excited by and I get the, like the childlike mentality with, and I just, I'm intrigued by humans and life and stories and the shit stuff. Because, like that's what makes you like all powerful and exciting and you as a person, like it's not all your triumphs and the things that people see on social media, like that make you who you are. It's like, when you're down and out and when you need a helping hand and, and when you've, you've had to make like really, really important decisions that have changed your life and probably other people's lives around you as well. And they're the, they're the things that make you a human being. I think I, I just like, I love being human. I think it's amazing. It's messy. It's, it's wrong. It's how the fuck, how the fuck have we got here? How are we doing this now? Like why, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And it's that every single thing that happens impacts something else. And it's like, just, it's like I've just took like a vow with myself to try and be as childlike towards everything as possible. Just like simple emotions, like am I having fun? Yes, do more of it. Am I sad? Cry, and just do and be and and just be intrigued and and ask questions and not feel silly for for feeling like excited. And I think people worry about trying to be a certain way or, or trying to present themselves in a certain way and. You know, I do that. Of course I do that sometimes. And, you know, we have an artistic direction we choose to take and all those things. But I only get to that point because, and, and I guess things start to feel cohesive because I learn things about people. I learn things about myself through that and like lessons you, you find out and things you know and things you, you know, like things you don't know and, and all just taking everything in and being, yeah, being overly excited and overly childlike about everything is like my my vow and, and one like true thing to my existence, I think. It's funny how we sometimes look down on that as we get older. Like when you see excitement in kids, it's a wonderful thing. But then someone who's excited, you know, when they're an adult, there's a weird kind of aversion to it for some reason. Let them be. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> I don't know. Someone might, someone might, it's, it, uh, yeah, but that only comes from the internet. If, if I saw someone say, say, I don't know, someone, some... 25 year olds bought some new hot wheels 
well excited about them in real life and showed me, I'd be like, sick, that's cool. You're excited because X, Y, and Z. And the only connotation that comes from that is when someone posts like, I've got these new Hot Wheels toys. Reply, reply, reply. You're 25, gave yourself, grow up. No. Like, I think that's, it, it kind of exists online and people, of course, you know, but I think there's this kind of instant negativity and it's, yeah, I don't know, just like, suck it off and like let people be. And, and is that like, is diff, like difference is the most exciting thing about us. And it's like, I keep, I say the, keep saying this phrase that keeps popping up to everyone, like comparison is the thief of joy. I think that's Oscar Wilde, isn't it? Yeah. Like stop looking left and right. And move forward and, and if th- something excites you follow it and, and, and prod it and shape it to something that you can take into your life and take forward with you you know yeah I feel like a lot of these people you're talking about too Joy's probably already dead like the reason they're making those comments is because they're trying to they're kind of reflecting what's going on in their own life and they're maybe not particularly happy so they want to try of and course it's, like it's, al- it's always a projection of self isn't it of like where you're at and, and you know that's like and you have to think you have to ask yourself all the time like if someone if someone is negative towards you and, and it's like what's the motive and 99% of the time the motive isn't a horrible one it's because something's going on in their life and they're not happy and they want to project it onto to you um just the wrong time yeah 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 it it is and i think you know it's i don't think it's ever well there's there's some people that come from like a you know just generally horrible human beings but just (laughs) i think i have to like really worked on it as well because you know i don't do it often enough if someone doesn't like the fuck will you do that for like you're a dick and then you're like no 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 you're not you're not it's fine it's like what's your motive like what's going on with you and that's why you've said that to me to make yourself feel better about x y and z or you know to try and to try and deflect or or you know not not confront things i think that's something we need more of empathy in that way always you know it's i think it's a very like common conversation in 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 my circles and in in you know like creative left-leaning circles uh these conversations and empathy and things it's like how do you extend that and again it comes back real life conversations i ain't gonna get like patriot 69 with an england flag in his twitter bio to kind of agree with a bunch of things i think online like, it's not gonna happen if, if you if you speak to these people in real life, like, and whenever you do meet them, and but you know, because I'm sure you don't exist in the same circles as they do, you can have such a nuanced conversation with these people and, and find middle ground on things that you would never would. Like, I think I think nuance is the thing that the internet's kind of like beaten out of people. Apart from like the the, the one good thing and the one uh, kind of redeeming feature is podcasts, and because you can have these long form conversations and and. You know, that's that's something that's something to something to be said about that. Yeah, just the ability to kind of try and the thing is, you can't understand how someone thinks in a tweet. There's no nuance in 140 characters, is there? But then if you have a conversation with them for an hour and you kind of approach them on multiple things, yeah. you can get a more rounded view of where they're coming yeah. from. Yeah, but no one's got an hour anymore, have they? So, um, what's yeah, anyone doing? Everyone's got an hour. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm kidding, <laughs> but I've not got an hour. I can't waste time. I've got to be being productive. Like, oh my god, someone else is doing something else. Oh my god, I got to do more. But yeah, it's um, yeah, it's an intriguing one. It's something I think I don't know. Like, I don't know what the, I don't know what the end goal is. I don't know what what the what the next like step is but it's like it's definitely not fear or finger pointing acceptance yeah yeah without a shadow of a doubt to come back to the opening song kind of the ep at large with right person wrong time what is the right time look like for you well it's changed now i think because i have perspective and uh <laughs> i was gonna be really cruel about that song there but i'm not because i love it um i think i think you get so wrapped up in a person in a situation and you again it's basically not taking responsibility for the thing falling apart and you've been like oh well it's a situation it's um it's not me it's it's them or i'm trying to do everything i can or, or maybe something else is getting in the way whether it's like distance or whether it's like circumstance a job this that and the other it's it's essentially like not being like oh, okay this is kind of falling apart. I'm I'm not going to take responsibility for that. Um, so I have kind of, I love that song and I think it's pure because it, it came from the most pure place of being like, I don't think this is working because X, Y, and Z, not me. It was like this. And yeah, I don't know when the right time is. Maybe, maybe, maybe in, if you ask me in a year's time and the situation has changed and it is the right time, then I'll be like, yeah, that song's the, the, the truest thing ever, blah, blah, blah. Um, is but, it ever the right time? No, nah, I think everything takes work and I think, Maybe that may, that's like a denial of like the work that needs to be done. Um, I love it. I really do love it. But my opinion of of that has has changed from being like that's the reason to oh, there's more to it. You know, 
It's interesting what you're saying there, but you know, there's always work that needs to be done. What work do you feel like you've done on yourself since that song was written? Um, taking responsibility for my own actions and trying to be more honest and open with everyone in my life, not just the person from that situation. And having like frank conversations is just admitting you're not right all the time. Like, I care and i think again motives like i really 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 truly care about what i do and 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 what i'm doing to other people in relationships and like taking the responsibility to be aware of like what your actions are going to impact to the person and i think i just i just know in my head like now that i think i'm embracing my flaw i embrace my flaws fully and I, I try not to deny too much and it, you know if someone's upset about something then i'll i'll make changes and have a conversation about it rather than burying my head in the sand rather than be like no no it's not me it's all the stuff that's going on it's fine it's fine it's like no cool it's it's me of course it's me it's that's fine to be wrong and, and to to be imperfect um and just it's a part of you but it's around. also a result of what's going on yeah of course yeah yeah um but yeah i just yeah i embrace my flaws a lot more and i'm incredibly probably overly aware like annoyingly aware of like how i am and yeah just yeah that's that's so many conversations about that over the past year or so does embracing your own flaws make you more forgiving of other people 100 percent. again back to the motive thing like if someone does something i'm like well i don't think they've done it to like outright hurt me it's like a byproduct of an action that they thought would benefit them that's kind of uh, hurt me in the end um or vice versa you know um i think yeah i think it's just made me more honest and open with everything do you see that in your music at all and what you've been writing since yeah definitely uh, like a, f- a fearlessness i think now to be multiple different versions of my personality that exist um and embracing some of them and and knowing and knowing again with it in music it's not real like some of it some of it is super close to home but you can dial your character up as well and you know like you look at i think because peter gabriel is like a big like, idol of mine you look how many kind of like different characters he's played through the years and and look at bowie like same thing and kind of taking a little bit of that now and being like well these these kind of personality traits can be dialed up and you can embrace some of them whether it be like the timidness and and the kind of like slim introvert in my head or this kind of boisterous extrovert that's intrigued by chaos and embrace that and, and get excited by it and, and, and not, yeah. And, and yeah, I think it's, it's just comes back to a fearlessness in, in trying to push things forward and not being worried about what other people are going to think, you know? 